Family Theater presents Betty Lynn, Jean Raymond, and Maria Anderson. Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents Gene Raymond and Mary Anderson in The Prisoner of Zenda to introduce the drama, your hostess, Betty Lynn. Thank you, Gene Baker. Family Theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. Every warm-blooded lover of fictional adventure, Anthony hopes the prisoner of Zenda ranks high. The court of Ruritania, the villainy of Black Michael, the dark forest of Zenda, and the unforgettable beauty of Princess Flavia all swim before us in the smoke that swirls from the pipe of the man who lived this adventure. But let Jean Raymond tell you of the prisoner of Zenda. My name is Rudolph Rassendil. My position in life is an enviable one. I'm a gentleman of leisure. And my social position is comfortable. I enjoy all the honors due the brother of Lord Burleston, head of the British Foreign Office. Many times he's offered me a post as ambassador to this or that European court. But though my brother will never know why, the idea of being ambassador does not dazzle me. For I have been a king. You see, I'd been told that writing suits a lazy man, so I set out upon a journey through the kingdoms of Central Europe, pausing here and there to make notes on the inhabitants, scenery, and local customs. Now, several kingdoms had not been included in my itinerary. One of these was Ruritania, for nothing ever happens in Ruritania. However, rather than wait for my train, which had been delayed in Parva to the north, I took the first available passage. It was, of course, the Golden Arrow, express to Ruritania. I was idly viewing the countryside when the door to my compartment slid open and a richly dressed woman entered. Oh, no, no, Conductor. I'd hope for a compartment to myself. I... Oh, well, forgive me, you... What is it, madam? No, you... You could not be the... Hmm? He's hunting in the forests of Zenda. Or perhaps, perhaps he is the hunted. Well, what do you mean? Wait, uh, who was it you took me for? Uh, won't you stay and tell me, please? As quickly as she'd come, she was gone. Fleeing along the passageway of the swaying, rumbling car. Now, it wouldn't have been in my nature to trouble myself long over the words of my mysterious traveling companion, but... Her mention of the Zenda forest recalled to my mind something I'd quite forgotten, that Zenda is noted for its superb hunting. And so it was, I soon found myself propped against the trunk of a fallen tree. My cartridge case by my left hand, my rifle at my right, asleep in the forest of Zenda. I was awakened at last by the voices of two men standing over me. You see, Colonel, I'm quite right about it. Yes, yes. Why, it's an amazing likeness. Shave him and he would be the king. She's awake, I'm sure of it. <laughs> yes, gentlemen, I'm awake. But who is it I resemble? Uh, may I ask your name, sir? Mm-hmm, Rudolf Rassendil, traveler from England. This is Colonel Sapt, and I am called Fritz von Talenheim. How do you do? Uh, we are in the service of the king of Ruritania. Uh, tell me, Mr. Rassendil... Do you propose visiting our capital? 
If you'll allow me to say so, I uh, seriously question the wisdom uh, of pray it. tell me, Colonel, of what crime a man is guilty simply because he bears the features of the king? Yeah, well, Your Majesty, it's strikes me that... from being an offense, this offers a pleasant diversion. Tonight, this stranger and I will drink to our extraordinary resemblance to one another. I'm compelled to remind Your Majesty we dine uh, sparingly tonight. <laughs> that is the Colonel's tactful way of reminding me that I must not imbibe too freely before my coronation tomorrow. Well, you have my word, Colonel Sept. A sober, somber king will receive the crown in Strelsau tomorrow. Uh, but your majesty... Even you, Colonel, must admit a man does not meet his flesh and blood image every day. And tonight, we celebrate the event at my hunting lodge. Joseph, more wine, man. Are we beasts to eat without drinking? Uh, sire. Well, what is it, Joseph? Well, speak up, man. Uh, His Highness, your majesty's brother bade me set this wine before the king and pray you drink to the love your brother bears you. Oh, oh good. We've not run out of toasts. My brother Michael, though absent, provides us with yet another. Out with a cork, Joseph. If you gentlemen will allow me, I shall drink a toast to Black Michael. I drink alone. To Michael, as sly a knave as ever coveted his brother's throne. As ever coveted the Princess Flavia. As ever... Remember tomorrow, Your Majesty. Drink no more tonight. I, Colonel, tomorrow. The coronation. I, I, Fritz, the coral nation. <coughs> wake up, wake up, man. Huh? Help to... us. We cannot revive the king. It's huh? Michael's doing, no doubt of that. The bottle Joseph brought for the king to drink his dear brother's health had been drugged by that same brother. Oh, fine fellow, this Michael. Does he consider himself a candidate for the throne? With half the army assembled in Strelsau, and Michael at the head of it, he's a very likely candidate indeed. Yes. Well, we must send for a doctor. Yeah, there's none within ten miles. No. If the king be not crowned in Strelsau today, he'll never be crowned. Rassendel, as a man grows old, he believes in fate. Fate sent you here... Fate sends you now to Strelsau. Well, I do look the part, and there's no denying it is a splendid one. You'll do it? I'll do it. Now, uh, uh, we've not much time. Fritz, see that the king is locked in the cellar uh, in one of the wine rooms at once. Of course, Colonel. Here, here. Uh, Arasendel, is the king's ring. Place it on your finger. <laughs> The streets of Strelsau were thronged with people. The balconies filled with gaily dressed ladies and a torrent of roses fell upon the man who rode to the cathedral to be crowned king of Ruritania. Stately organ music filled the vaulted arches as I walked up the great nave of the cathedral. And all seemed as in a dream. But through the seeming unreality, two faces stood out clearly. The black hair and scowling countenance of one told me I was in the presence of Black Michael. He betrayed an unspoken question in his dark, treacherous eyes as he knelt to swear undying loyalty to I, Michael, Duke of Strelsau, do pledge to serve and protect with all loyalty and zeal the person of my liege lord, revered brother, crown king of Ruritania. I further swear to render... The danger smoldering in Michael's voice was soon lost to my ears, but for now... All my senses were under the spell of that other face. A fair and fragile face. A face perhaps divine. The face of Princess Flavia, who in her turn came to kneel I, before Flavia me. I, Flavia Alexandra, of the house of Ethelberg, do pledge all duty and homage unto my liege lord, reverend cousin, crown king Ruritania. 
I further swear to serve my liege with loyalty and zeal, to render Listen unto him to those all duties. those cold and solemn words, dignified, perfunctory words. Then the crown was placed upon my head, and I, Rudolph Rassendil, was king of Ruritania. <laughs> After the coronation, we went through the streets to the palace. At my left, in the state coach, rode the king's betrothed, the Princess Flavia. Sire, did you notice Michael today? Yes, he wasn't enjoying himself, was he? He uh, covets the crown and wants something else that as yet does not belong to me, but which someday I hope to win. And now I'm sure of it. But I must say, Colonel Sapt has instructed you very well in such a short time. <sighs> You, you mean you... I mean I can see through a pretense as feeble as the one you are employing. You think I'm unaware that my heart is a matter of state and my wooing only expert statecraft? Oh, you misjudge my motives. I... No, no, no. You need not feel compelled to make love to me. You should concentrate on the reception at the palace. After all, have you not enough responsibilities for one day? You must take me back inside. This ball is in your honor, sire. Now, first, you must catch your breath. I've never danced the mazurka so fast. You've never danced it with me. No. No, I don't think I ever have. Flavia. Oh. My dearest, I... Don't speak. I think I know. I knew it first at the coronation. You knew? Yes. And my heart responded. I, I was proud and, and happy for the first time. Oh, Flavia, dearest... I, I must tell you... A thousand pardons, uh, sire. Colonel, sir. Confound it, Colonel. Well, I assure your majesty, had it not been imperative that I interrupt when I did, uh, an urgent matter has presented itself. Flavia. Of course, your majesty. I'll wait for you in the ballroom. What is this urgent matter of which you spoke? It's more than urgent. The king has disappeared. Disappeared? Yes. Although the lodge was thoroughly searched... He was not to be found. But surely he wouldn't... However, this message was delivered to me a moment ago. It's for you. Oh. Was he hunting or was he the hunted? Now my question is answered. But I can tell you where they've taken him if you will come alone at half past eleven to the deserted summer house on the boulevard Elfberg. Your friend and traveling companion. Yeah? I thought you had journeyed oh. to Ruritania alone. So I did, but for a few seconds only, I did have a traveling companion, a woman who acted very strangely. Where is this deserted summer house? Uh, at the end of that avenue of trees. But you're not going. It may be a trap. Colonel, we're playing against time. We must play high. We must force the game. And then, too, every day I masquerade like this, I shall become a weaker man, for every day I shall be more in love with Flavia. Let me act now, while I still care what happens to your king. <laughs> Shortly after 11, I went alone to keep the appointment. There was not even the call of a night bird as I made my way cautiously along the dark avenue of trees. Presently, a large object loomed out of the gloom. The summer house. Quickly, come inside and close the door. Oh, thank heaven you're early. I could never learn to be punctual. It's a failing of mine. Your being early has saved your life. I wrote that letter at Michael's orders. So I thought. In a quarter of an hour, three men will be here to kill you. Now, here's what you must do if you're to save your life and the king's. How can the life of the king concern you if you serve the king's brother? Colonel Sept can tell you that Antoinette de Mauban has reason enough not to want Michael crowned king and married to the Princess Flavia. I love Michael. My motives are the motives of a woman in love. Mm -hmm. Where is the king? Before I tell you... Give me your word no harm will come to Michael. I give you my word. They've taken the king to Michael's castle near Zender. Zender? Very well, I... Wait. If the castle is attacked, the king will be killed instantly. But tomorrow Michael departs for Zender. I'm going too. The room I will occupy is just above the moat that surrounds the castle. My window can be seen from the east bank. Be there tomorrow night. Wait for a signal. All right. <laughs> <laughs> 
What will the signal be? A candle passed back and forth before the window. Now hurry. Leave before they come. Next morning, Colonel Sapt announced to the court that the king and a small party would leave on a hunting excursion. I regret that we cannot amuse your majesty here. I would have offered you more entertainment, but I was foolish enough to think... <laughs> oh, Flavia, after last night, can you believe that I would willingly leave you for a moment unless... Unless the hunting of wild boars were not more pressing than our horseback ride this afternoon? This is what... like you used to be. Not like the man... the man that I've come to love. Oh, Flavia, dearest, do you really think I'm leaving you to go hunting? No, Flavia. I go to join Michael. Michael? And... and when will you be back? Will it be soon? Shall not a man come back to the loveliest lady in all the world? No. A thousand Michaels shall not keep me from you. Our hunting party made its way to the forest of Zender. At nightfall, Michael's castle loomed like a phantom across the black, stagnant waters of the moat. The night was cold. The wind pierced. There it is. The signal. Ready, Rassendel? I'm ready. We'll lower the rope, Fritz. Yes, Colonel. We'll wait for you here in this spot. I'll not be long. <laughs> Gently, I lowered myself into the water. With slow, silent strokes, I began to swim toward the walls of the castle. And toward the window at which the pale, ghastly light moved to and fro. Reaching from the water, my fingers clutched at the ragged edges of stone for a handhold. Slowly, stone by stone, I inched up the cold wall of the castle. Finally, I reached the casement of the window. Come, let me help you. Thank you. Ah, these moats are oddly enough damp. The king, what of him? He's very ill. Blind despair has made him pitiful to see. But more than that, his life is in grave danger. What does Michael intend doing with him? Unless he signs the abdication papers Michael has brought, he has not long to live. Where are they keeping him? In a dungeon, down a flight of stairs at the end of the cross hall. And how do they guard him? Two men are with him at all times. Two others rest in a room just above. Yeah, there's very little advantage on our side, not even hope. I found one in the castle whom we can trust. Good. His name is Paul. He's served me before. Is this sword and ship to be relied on? Paul is only a servant in the castle. And cannot use a sword. Huh? Now, wait a minute. He can still be worth his hire if tomorrow night, at a given time, he releases the rope holding the drawbridge. But an instant alarm will yes, begin. Yes, but if I were near the dungeon at that time, I could perhaps gain access and keep them from killing the king till our hunting party had stormed the castle. I know it's a desperate plan, but we must plan desperately. In all this, Michael must not be hired. I've given you my word he won't be. Of course... It means exile for him. Oh, can you not see that that is what I want? I can be with him. I can care for him. You will swim the moat again tomorrow night? Yes, sometime between one and two. Good. If the king still lives, I'll place this candle in the window. The next night was dark and stormy. Gusts of wind and spits of rain caught us as we waited for the signal that would tell us that the king was still alive. Finally, it appeared. And our plan was ready to be put into operation. Mademoiselle de Maubin, Colonel Sapt and I have agreed upon the time of meeting as two o'clock. The Colonel and Fritz von Tollenheim will charge with our men the moment the drawbridge is lowered. And you, meanwhile? I will endeavor to protect the king. Now. Now, to work. Yes. Careful. The door bolt must be lifted carefully. Michael's room is just across the hall. The dungeon steps are to your left. Keep close to the wall. And where is Paul? Above. Those stairs lead to the room where he's waiting. Now remember, the time is two o'clock. Yes. You must not fail by an instant. I will tell him. 
eerie, restless shadows played about the figure of Antoinette de Maubin as she moved noiselessly up the staircase and out of sight. Making my own way toward the dungeon below, I had no means of knowing that as she approached the door of that room upstairs and moved it open, she found Joseph bending over the body of a man he had just killed. Our ally, Paul. At your service, madame. Joseph! What happened? Paul has met with an unfortunate accident, madame. You have killed him. Only in order to serve you better, madame. Was I not employed by his highness, Duke Michael, to drug the king? And to that you add cold-blooded murder. Only because whatever Paul's task tonight, I, Joseph, can perform it so much more ably. Shall we discuss it downstairs? After you, madame, enter ahead of me. Be careful closing the door. The boat rattles. That noise we heard. The castle is asleep. It is nearly two. Nearly two? Ah, two o'clock. And what happens at two o'clock? Michael's door. It just opened. It's crossing the hall. I'll hide over here. I'll say nothing, madame, if you value his life. Antoinette, whose voice was that? I heard a voice. No. I- I'm alone, Michael. Behind that tapestry. Yes, behind the tapestry. No! No, Michael! He's behind the screen in front of the Michael behind you! Ah! Oh! Michael! Oh, Michael! Oh, Michael! I did it for you and now. Why did I let them come? Why? Let them come? Some trick I... Kill... I did it for you. Kill the prisoner! Antoinette's shriek had been heard through the castle and at the sound of it, the door of the dungeon was thrown open. Michael's voice had reached the guard at the door. At the instant he turned to repeat the command, I sprang from the shadows, seized him by the neck and threw him to the steps. I leapt into the dungeon, closing and bolting the door with what strength was left. A single torch lit the dungeon. The second guard had drawn his sword. I pulled the torch from the wall and hurled it through the hole in the floor. It sizzled in the water below and the room was plunged in darkness. Where are you? I can't see you. Ah, then we're evenly matched, my friend. For you two are invisible. We thrust, buried in the darkness. Our sight was in our swords alone. Come down this darkness. What? What chance do you think you have, man? Eh? And neither of us can move very freely. Get me. But ah! as he fell, a loud, deafening crash was heard. King was still alive. Next day, I was ushered into the king's bedchamber. My life is yours, Rassendorf. My thanks are all too meager. Ah, your thanks are due to Antoinette de Montbain, your highness. It was she who cut the drawbridge ropes... Oh, here's your ring. I've tried not to dishonor it. Dishonor it? You have ennobled it. I want to keep you here with me and tell everyone what you've done, but you would have been my best and nearest friend. But Colonel Sapp tells me the secret must be kept. He's right. I must go. My work here is done. You take with you the undying gratitude of a king. If I've served you... Served me? Oh, no. You've taught me how to be the king. Come, Rassendil. To the thanks the king has given you, may I add my gratitude as well? We've run a good course between us, Colonel. I... Why do you stop? Are you not going with me to the courtyard? I'll wait for you here. In the music room is someone who has come to Zender Castle to uh, see you. Someone? Open the door. Flavia. Rudolph. You know... Have they told you? Yes, everything. Is it true you're returning to England? Yes, I must. As a matter of state, must be kept secret. My heart is a matter of state. I said that once. I thought it was true at the time. Flavia, 
I love you. I love you with all my heart and soul. Come with me. Come with me, Clavian. If love were all, I would follow you. In rags, if need be, to the world's end. If love were all, perhaps for some, fate lets it be. But not for us. Honor binds me to my country and to my house. Oh, help me. Help me to do my duty. My love. My dearest. I... Help me. Help me. Your heart will always be in my heart. And the touch of your lips always on mine. You must reign. And not weep for me. Oh, Rudolph. Rudolph. Smoke whirling past the window of my train hid the countryside from view. But how often the smoke from my pipe recalls the vision of a fair and fragile face. The face of Flavia. Yes, I have been a king. And I have loved a queen. Betty Lynn again. You know, as I was listening to tonight's story, a new thought struck me. Many of us are tempted to say, if I can't have what I want, I don't want anything. But life isn't like that. Often we have to settle for the second best. And the strange and wonderful thing is that so many times it actually turns out to be the first best. I guess it's just that God knows better than we what is really good for us. The person who prays regularly will understand that. The family that prays together each day will realize that God is always protecting them, always binding them closer in a bond of unity and love. Yes, they will come to understand that the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Hollywood Family Theater is brought to you Gene Raymond and Mary Anderson in The Prisoner of Zender with Betty Lynn as your hostess. Featured in our cast were Gene Bates, Francis X. Bushman, Harold Derenforth, High Aberback, Robert Griffin, Howard Culver, and Clayton Post. Anthony Hope's classic was adapted by Peter Rankin with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman and was directed for Family Theater by Jaime Del Valle. This series of family theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this type of program, by the mutual network which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who have so unselfishly given of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Gene Baker expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your family. And inviting you to join us next week at this time when Family Theater will present Edmund O'Brien and Elizabeth Scott in The Man Without a Country. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network, the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mm -hmm.